day, uh, and we have now reached our, our final pi panel of the day. Uh, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the non-lethal weapons panel. Uh, Ms. Susan Levine is the Principal Deputy Director for Policy and Strategy at the Joint Non-Lethal Weapons Directorate, where she serves as Senior Advisor to the Director of JNLWD on matters related to its policy and strategy, and in general, overall Department of Defense non-lethal weapons program planning, financial investment, and special topics of interest. We're very grateful that she's agreed to moderate our panel, and without further ado, Ms. Susan Levine. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And I know this panel is between you guys and the weekend, um, but we're going to try to make it an enjoyable hour in about an uh, hour and 10 minutes that we've got uh, here this afternoon. And I think it's going to be a very lively discussion knowing some of these panelists and um, their views and their interest uh, on this topic. Um, although, before I introduce these panelists, I, I do uh, have to start, I think, on somewhat of a sad note. Uh, one of our panelists, Michael Gross uh, from the University of Haifa in Israel, is not here today. He lost his father earlier this week. And um, so we're very saddened uh, for that loss and the fact that he won't be here to join us because he has written extensively on non-lethal weapons and certainly has a lot of uh, views on, on the topic. Um, so we're going to miss that insight. Um, but with that, though, let me go ahead and start introducing our panel. Um, and I'll start at the end of the table with uh, David Coflo. Uh, David has been a prof professor of law at the Georgetown University Law Center in Washington since 1981. His primary fields for teaching and scholarship involve public international law and national security law, with a particular emphasis upon arms control, nonproliferation, and anti-terrorism. He has published five books and numerous law review articles regarding treaty negotiation, verification, and implementation, and regarding the intersection between international legal standards and U.S. constitutional and statutory law. He has served as a government advisor and special assistant to the director of the U.S. Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, also as deputy general counsel for international affairs to the Department of Defense, and as special counsel for arms control to the general counsel of the U.S. U.S. Department of Defense. He's a graduate of Harvard College and Yale Law School and was a Rhodes Scholar. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Pauline shanks Karn, who holds a Ph.D. in philosophy from Temple University and is a specialist in military ethics, just war theory, philosophy of law, and applied ethics. She is an associate professor of philosophy at Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma and teaches courses in military ethics, warfare, business ethics, and early modern philosophy. Recent publications include When Less Is Not More, Expanding the Combatant, Non-Combatant Distinctions, and With Fear and Trembling, A Qualified Defense of Non-Lethal Weapons, and also The Warrior in Military Ethics and Contemporary Warfare, Achilles Goes Asymmetric. And then let me introduce Dr. Stephen Coleman, a senior lecturer in ethics and leadership in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences and the program director for military ethics at the Australian Center for the Study of Armed Conflict and Society at the University of New South Wales. Before joining the University of New South Wales, he worked for seven years teaching ethics to police officers at the New South Wales Police College, as well as serving as a research fellow at the Center for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics. While working at UNSW, he spent an academic year as a resident fellow at the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership at the United States Naval Academy. Stephen has published a large number of academic papers in various forms and has presented papers at conferences worldwide. His most recent book, Military Ethics and Introduction with Case Studies, was published by Oxford University in 2013. And in addition to his academic duties, he also works to increase understanding of ethical issues in less traditionally academic fora, given talks and presentations in schools and public venues. His talk on the moral dangers of non-lethal weapons is available at TED.com and has more than a half a million views. So I, I, I'm sure you join me in recognizing that we've got a great panel here. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to them for their introductory remarks, uh, starting with David. Okay. Thank you, uh, Susan. Uh, and even though time is short, I feel compelled to begin with more than the usual pro forma thank you to the organizers of this terrific conference because we've had today really an extraordinary opportunity to combine 
detailed analysis of four related but distinct kinds of military technologies in a way that uh, provides, I think, some special opportunities for insights. These four programs are rarely juxtaposed in this way, and I think it provides some, uh, some special uh, opportunities for, uh, for education. And I also say, on a more personal note, that I think it's completely appropriate that the day be structured to make this panel the culminating, the featured <laughs> event, the, the, the way to go out with a bang, a non-lethal bang. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm delighted to participate in this. Uh, and in the effort to, uh, to continue the kind of provocative discussions that we've had uh, already today, I'll offer in the brief time available to, to me uh, four opening observations, one of praise and three of criticism. And the law students in the room will know that that's the usual ratio for law school professors, <laughs> is that whenever you offer even one positive or neutral comment, you balance that with three complaints or criticisms or at least cautionary notes. And so that's, that's the formula that I'll adopt. The first uh, observation, the, the, uh, the, the, the positive one, is that in my view, non-lethal weapons really do offer a new capability for filling an old gap, for solving a problem that has, uh, has bedeviled police, law enforcement officers, and military in this country and elsewhere for an awfully long time. Uh, and that is that these officers often find themselves in mixed situations where there are civilians or other innocents, and there are also belligerents or criminals and the mission is to impose your will on that situation, to accomplish an objective without overdoing it, without inflicting more damage uh, than is necessary to accomplish the mission. And that's a delicate combination uh, that, uh, that, uh, that needs to be filled and that the emergence of new generations of non-lethal technology offers at least the prospect that we can begin to address that kind of problem. And it's a problem that is only going to uh, accelerate. That is, these days, the US military, to take one example, is frequently tasked with what's called military operations in urban terrain. And that seems to be the face of modern combat. And there's every reason to expect that that will continue to be a problem that will uh, uh, afflict our operations. Uh, and the military performs military operations other than war, including peacekeeping operations and certain kinds of counterterrorism operations that demand an effective but deft touch. And importantly in this, uh, to me, the purpose of pursuing non-lethal weapons technology is not to be nicer, to be more gentle. The purpose is to accomplish the mission, but only to accomplish the mission and not to, uh, to incur excessive casualties or property damage. So that's the first point. Now on to the, uh, the complaints or the criticisms. Uh, and the first of those is that, in my view, the technology here has evolved too slowly. The array of non-lethal weapons capabilities that are currently offered to police and, um, and military is disappointing that the tools consist of, of capabilities that are not all that different from what was available five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And the cascade of new kinds of technology that people imagined a decade or two ago mostly has not happened. Uh, people used to talk about uh, innovations in slippery foam and sticky fo foam and, uh, and acoustic mechanisms that have just not proven themselves, uh, 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 just not been proven and, and been made available. I'll, I'll take just a moment to describe what is for me the most interesting non-lethal technology, and that is the active denial system that I'm sure some of you have heard about. It's a mechanism for sending a millimeter wave energy beam out to long distance, a kilometer or more. And when the beam hits you, it generates, it makes you feel heat, like you've been burned. 
But the technology does not, in fact, burn, does not, in fact, inflict harm on you. And it would be enormously useful, in my view, for a variety of law enforcement and especially military operations. The technology has been tested thousands of times over a period of years. It was deployed to Afghanistan and never used there. Uh, and it seems to me that the reasons why it was not used are a complicated story uh, that perhaps Susan can enlighten us on a little bit uh, that, uh, that shows something about an excessive timidity of, by the Department of Defense in using one of the very few new military technologies that would be available in the non-lethal weapons realm. So that's my first point. Briefly, my second point, uh, second criticism, is about the relevant international law on point. All new military technologies have to undergo a serious uh, legal review, and the, each of the uh, candidate non-lethal weapons technologies has done that as well. Uh, and the law imposes some limitations on this. Um, perhaps some of the panels will talk about discrimination as being uh, a leading legal uh, uh, principle that, that's at play here. Uh, treaties play a role as well. Any chemical non-lethal agent has to nestle inside the constraints of the Chemical Weapons Convention. Biological uh, uh, non-lethal weapons are even more impeded by the Biological Weapons Convention. Even lasers, dazzling lasers, have to take cognizance of the uh, convention on certain, uh, certain conventional weapons. So there is a role for, for law to play uh, in, in all this as well. And then the final point I'll make is one about the dangers associated with non-lethal weapons. And I'll very briefly highlight two one is the danger of possible overuse. That is, any time we remove the, or reduce the, some of the adverse consequences of an action, such as using a weapon, we should expect that that action will happen more often, even in circumstances where it turns out to be a bad deal, a bad idea nonetheless. Uh, it might be that non-lethal weapons make us too quick on the trigger in a situation where it seems to be relatively cheap to shoot first and ask questions later because the consequences of shooting first are reduced. I think that's a danger. Uh, and then finally, the danger of proliferation. If this stuff works, if this, these non-lethal capabilities are in fact effective and desirable, we have to contemplate that it won't be only US law enforcement and US military that have access to these tools, but they will proliferate to a variety of other actors as well, including opposing military, including, including um, uh, uh, terrorists, including uh, criminal elements as well, uh, and we need to be mindful of, of that as well. So that's my, uh, my opening round of, of uh, the three to one ratio of complaints to, uh, to, to praise. Okay. Thank you. Um, Pauline? Um, thanks, David. That was really helpful. Um, and I also echo your, your thanks to the organizers. I know it's um, late in the day, and I flew in from the West Coast very early this morning, so um, bear with me, and I'll try to make this as interesting as possible for you so you don't fall asleep like my students do in class. <laughs> um, I do military ethics, so I'm really interested in, not surprisingly, the ethical dimensions of non-lethal weapons. I'm not necessarily a specialist in non-lethal weapons. I came to this topic, kind of fell into this topic, through considerations of use in bellow and the rules of war. So you will hear me uh, talk about discrimination a lot uh, later on. But one of the things that I would echo with David is the, the, the slowness of the development, and I actually sort of I know this is a, uh, a panel and a day on emerging technologies, but as a philosopher, I would like to ask the question of, is our non-lethal weapon still an emerging technology? I think that would be an interesting question mm -hmm. if you want to pursue that mm -hmm. um, in our question and answer time. But es essentially, I think what's emerging about non-lethal weapons isn't the technology itself, because David's absolutely right. I think it's the ethical issues that the technology has the potential to raise. Um, and so, first of all, I think non-lethal weapons highlight the risk-averse and zero-casualty nature of contemporary warfare. Now, obviously, that's a vast generalization, but I'll defend it, uh, if you like. Uh, second of all, they raise many of the same issues that some of uh, the other technologies, uh, whether that's the use of social media in warfare or UAVs um, or, or other kinds of things that are considered emerging technologies. Uh, especially in terms of targeting and discrimination, non-lethal weapons bring up important issues uh, for targeting and discrimination. It is a shame that Michael's not here because he and I totally disagree on yeah. that issue. 
Um, and then third, uh, non-lethal weapons are emerging technologies in the sense that they can challenge and impact the standard military doctrine that's oriented towards largely lethal combat force, sort of as the dominant mode of war. Now that's, we could argue that's been eroding to some degree, uh, but I think that's still, uh, I think that's still our dominant paradigm of war. And I think non-lethal weapons uh, don't get rid of that, but they complicate that picture. Um, so. I want to highlight a few things that I think are important, sort of five uh, things that we can come back to just to help frame our discussion. So there's sort of five issues that non-lethal weapons bring up. First of all is that of targeting. Who's a legitimate object of war apart from what the effect of that targeting is? Uh, not that that's not important. That is important. Uh, but in my view, that's farther down the list, right? There, and these are in order of importance for me. Um, so who's a legitimate object of war? Second of all, discrimination between combatants and non-combatants. Um, and what level of risk is, is necessary, especially for a combatants to be taking in order um, for war to be ethical? That's my third point. Fourth, what is the impact of these weapons on both combatants and non-combatants? We talk a lot about what the impact on non-combatants are, but I think we need to consider the impact on combatants as well. And then lastly, what's the long-term collateral damage, for lack of a better term, and impact of these technologies aside from the considerations of proportionality? So what are the impacts in terms of geopolitical uh, negotiations, in terms of the restoration of the peace, in terms of winning hearts and minds? So those are sort of five things that I think are important to kind of help us frame the discussion. Thank you. Stephen, I think you're going to give us a little brief. Uh, uh, right. oh, well, yes. A little bit. Okay. <laughs> uh, I thought along the lines that a picture's worth a thousand words. If I threw up a couple of pictures, that might actually help to um, speed up what I would say. Um, two main things that I think are issues of concern with non-lethal weapons. Um, I think that they are obviously good in lots and lots of circumstances. So to just take a really recent policing example, it clearly would have been a lot better in Ferguson, Missouri, if Michael Brown had been shot with a taser instead of a firearm. This is a circumstance you know, where an unarmed person has been shot. It's clearly going to be better if they don't die. It's clearly going to be better if a non-lethal weapon was used there. But I think there are a lot of problems that come up with non-lethal weapons and I'll expand on at least one of the things that David's talked about. One of them, I think, is in fact the way that they might get misused just because of the way they've been developed and the way people are trained about using them. So when you're testing non-lethal weapons, you know, with the best will in the world, all of these companies that are developing non-lethal weapons say, well, we've got to test it lots and lots of times. You can test it thousands and thousands of times, but you aren't really doing it with continual monitoring, you're doing it on healthy individuals, you're doing it in a really nicely controlled environment. So I love these two pictures on the right hand side here where the, the top one there where they're uh, doing um, pepper spray, the person spraying it is wearing a surgical glove so they don't get a secondary contamination from the spray. <laughs> the, the bottom one here where they're showing someone what it's like to be shot with a taser, there's two guys there to catch him when he falls. Uh, and a soft mat for him to fall on as well, so that he doesn't get hurt. This is the nice controlled environment where people learn about using these non-lethal weapons. And then they go out and they use them in the real world. And they don't have that continual monitoring. They're not checking what people's health is before they use them. If you can't read the cartoon in the top there, it says, HALT or I'll zap you. But before I do, if I could ask you some questions about your general health, especially pre-existing heart conditions. <laughs> <laughs> Never happens. All right. So they use these things out in the real world in an uncontrolled environment. And even if you've tested it thousands of times, if you then give it to, say, 10,000 police officers, and each one of them uses it a couple of times over the course of a year, you've suddenly got an extra 20,000 tests in a much more uncontrolled environment. And because they've learnt that these things are safe, you often find the psychology is, well, you can use it anywhere and any time and there won't be any problems. All right? 
Now, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking this picture on the right hand side, yeah, the black spot is because this guy is in fact naked. He's standing on the top of a security shutter. He's armed himself with a long fluorescent tube. I don't think you have to be a genius to work out this guy might have a pre-existing medical condition. <laughs> All right, you probably cannot see it, but you can see the police officer at the bottom putting his arm up towards that guy. In fact, if you uh, have a close <coughs> enough view of it, you can see taser wires heading up. That shot was, the photograph was taken right at the moment that this guy was shot with the taser. He then proceeded to fall off the security shutter onto his head and died. All right. This is the sort of use in an uncontrolled environment that I'm talking about. Even the perfect non-lethal weapon, which I know Susan mentioned, the phaser from Star Trek, she mentioned as a possible question we could discuss later. This thing, even in its use in Star Trek, is just too perfect. Right? Nobody falls downstairs and breaks their arm after being shot with a, with a phaser on Star Trek. Right? Nobody falls off a rock and lands on their head and injures themselves. It's just perfect. But that's not the way the real world works. So that's one sort of problem, the uncontrolled way that these things get used. And of course, the possible problems that you might have. Uh, I know there was a case in Australia where a police officer used pepper spray on a person that he knew was an asthmatic. I actually argued when I was talking to my students at the time about it, that is a use of deadly force. And he could not have been realistically, ethically justified in using pepper spray on this person unless he would have been justified in shooting him. All right. So that's one thing. The second one David mentioned is the overuse of these things. This is just a little graph that I use because I think it illustrates things so well. We don't have many police shootings in Australia. So uh, that red arrow illustrates the point in time where the Australian state of Queensland said we're going to introduce pepper spray, OC spray, to give police officers an alternative to the use of deadly force so that if they're in a situation where they would have to use deadly force, they can use pepper spray instead. And you can see there are about six police shootings uh, around the entire country. First two years that the Queensland police had pepper spray available to them, did they use it six times as an alternative to the use of deadly force? Uh, no. Right, they used it that number of times, 2,226. And a lot of these situations, the person that they were using it on wasn't even armed. Right. Oh, they might be violent, so we'll use pepper spray. They're passively non-compliant, as was the case with the uh, pepper spray cop at the um, protest at UC Davis. So these are the sorts of problems that you run into with overuse. And I think, again, it's because of that psychological barrier. If I use lethal force, this person dies. But it's much easier to use non-lethal force. And you see that, I think, all over the place with the use of tasers as well. And you get these sorts of headlines from newspapers. These are all actual newspaper headlines. And you can see it's not just in Texas, New Mexico, Florida. Canada and London as well, although the one at the bottom from Oklahoma I think is in fact my um, personal favourite of these uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, appro appropriate or inappropriate uses of non-lethal weapons. I read the report on that one. Yes, apparently this woman took up a more threatening position in her bed. <laughs> <laughs> and that was what the police officer said in his official report about why he had decided to use a taser in this case. Again. I don't think that any of these cases would have been solved by the use of firearms. In none of these cases was a police officer thinking, hey, I'm going to have to shoot this person if I don't taser them. In every case, it's, this is non-lethal, so it's OK. Maybe we can um, go back okay. to that. All right. Well, great. OK, well. We've got a, a lot of different directions we can go um, in our discussion. Um, but maybe we'll start with uh, Pauline. You know, you posed a question about emerging technologies, and um, Stephen has just talked a little bit about some existing technologies. And Dave mentioned the uh, millimeter wave uh, active denial system. So um, let's, let's talk about the technology maybe to start things off. And um, 
So let me ask you, um, there are many different technologies associated with non-lethal weapons. And you know, the things that exist today, riot control agents, pepper spray, electric stun devices, and blunt impact munitions, things like bean bags, um, and things that I would consider personally emerging are things like the millimeter wave um, active denial system, or microwaves that could be used to shut down vehicle or vessel engines. Um, and also today, there's out there dazzling lasers that can be used to uh, temporarily uh, impair a person's vision. And I think that's what we're seeing there uh, on that photo. Uh, so I'd like to ask the panel to maybe discuss um, what their views are on these different type of technologies uh, that are used uh, to create non-lethal weapons. And do you believe that one technology is preferable over the other? So let's start, um, David. Sure. Um, well, I, I guess, the, the Earlier, one of, the, one of the earlier panels, there was a discussion about uh, whether we've got a 21st century problem with uh, 20th century technology and 19th century law. And this may be some of that as well. One of the frequent thumbnail descriptions has been that law enforcement officers in the United States and elsewhere have complained that they find themselves equipped not that differently from the way Wyatt Earp was equipped 200 years ago. That uh, when you confront a problematic situation and uh, there are bad guys around and there are also civilians around and the, the mission of the law enforcement authorities is to impose their will uh, on the bad guys without harming the civilians. In Wyatt Earp's day, he could shout at the bad guys or he could shoot them. And there wasn't much in between. And the purpose of non-lethal weapons is to try to provide some additional capability between shouting and shooting. To my mind, we haven't gotten very much better at that intermediate capability today than in Wyatt Earp's time. There certainly won't be one technology that solves that problem across the board for all kinds of situations because the situations are just too diverse. You'll never have one kind of magic bullet that can solve the problem uh, across the board. Uh, and things like tasers, things like pepper spray can play a role, but that's not very dramatically different from what we've had, what we've, what we've become familiar with. The modern blunt trauma instruments, not that better, that much better than they were 20 years ago. Modern pepper spray, not that much better than its precursors as well. Um, tasers are better than what used to be available, but they're limited as well in being relatively short range and capable of dealing with only one person at a time. The idea of being more long range and being able to deal with more people simultaneously is just not something that the technology has yet been able to, to solve. Any other perspectives? Now sure. Um, I, I'll be a cranky philosopher here <laughs> um, and say, that I think, listen, I think technology is important, obviously, because I can't live without this, uh, to text my children. Um, but I think sometimes we look to technology to solve ethical problems. And what we have is an ethical problem that you have uh, these situations where either police or military personnel are involved in complicated situations where you have combatants and non-combatants or um, you know, police officers and, and civilians, innocents, and then people who are belligerents or people who are criminals, and it's messy. You have a messy moral problem, so I am highly skeptical of any attempt of technology to solve that problem. That said, I think technology can be a tool, just like it's a tool in my classroom, but it can't fix things. It can't fix an ethical problem. Um, in, in the example of my classroom, what goes on is a me developing a relationship with my students. So to the degree that me using Twitter or PowerPoint, which never happens because I don't know what to do with PowerPoint, but to the degree that I use technology, it's to enhance or to facilitate that ethical relationship. So to the degree that non-lethal weapons can slow down the escalation of force, can give um, whether it's police or military people, more time to make determinations about who's a combatant and who's not a, a non-combatant. In other words, to make uh, determinations, moral judgments about discrimination or about proportionality or give them other options to try to resolve the situation 
to the degree that technology, whatever it is, is helpful in that regard, I think that's fabulous. And I agree with, with the Stephen. I think, we, you know, that's good. But it's only a tool. It can't, it can't get us out of, oh, we have this messy problem of discrimination. So let's use non-lethal weapons. So we don't have to worry about that because it's non-lethal. So you can still like target people and accept that, right, there's complications. So I'm kind of, I'm, I think the technology is important, but for me, the technology is really instrumental. It's going to buy people time. It's going to give people time to make necessary moral judgments about what's the right level of force. And really importantly for me, who should be targeted, right? Who should be the object of that force and who should not be? Yeah. I mean, I, I would echo your comments about, that you made earlier about how slow these things are to develop. Because thinking about the situation with the extended use of force by police in Ferguson when they're using tear gas and rubber bullets. I'm trying to remember the first time I heard about tear gas and rubber bullets being used somewhere, and I suspect it was more than 30 years ago that my first memory of hearing that happen is. It, it's pretty stunning that despite all of these apparent technological developments in other areas that still, oh, the best way to deal, well, the way we are going to deal with an apparent right here is to deal with it with tear gas and rubber bullets that something have been used for de literally decades. Um, I do think I disagree with you on at least one thing with regard to non-lethal weapons, certainly in a police context, but probably in the military context as well, and in this I'm probably much closer to uh, what Pauline was saying. I don't think you actually want non-lethal weapons that target more than one person. I think in the military context, that's an issue of discrimination. But for the police, my view as someone who has taught police about the use of force is that the police should only ever be using force to deal with a particular threat. And that means a particular person. And so the police should be using, if they are using a non-lethal weapon, they're using a non-lethal weapon that will end the threat from this particular person and let that person be taken into custody. So I don't think they should ever be using tear gas uh, or even the active denial system or anything like that, unless you know, the active denial system partly for a different reason. I think this person is violent, this person is a threat, this person needs to be dealt with, so whatever technology you're using, whatever weapon you're using, has to be something that ends the threat from that person. If that person's got a gun, then you've probably got a gun and you're using it, and that's ending the threat from that person. If that person, say, has a knife and you're using a non-lethal weapon against them, then a taser that allows you to take them into custody, pepper spray that disables them so they can't use the knife and you can take them into custody. Again, I think that's what you're talking about from a policing perspective, that you're trying to end the threat from this individual. Um, I don't see any reason why the police would be using the active denial system, even when it's discriminatory, because it doesn't allow you to take that person into custody. It just causes people to run away. Um, for the military, again, I don't think, I agree with you, there's no need to be using weapons. You shouldn't be using weapons that have a large area of effect that are non-lethal because you're trying to be discriminate. You have to be discriminate. Well, to be provocative, let's, let's, <laughs> let's engage on that one in particular because a scenario that I have in mind that I think is a, an increasingly familiar one for US military deployed in urban environments around the world is one where the mission is in part to protect a facility, an embassy, a military base, whatever it is. And the, the danger, the threat comes in the form of a crowd advancing toward you across a plaza or some open area. And uh, the crowd includes a mixture of people, many of whom are civilians, many of whom are curiosity seekers, some are angry, some are shouting, some might be throwing rocks, and some might be shooting guns. And the mission is to protect that, that installation from being overrun. What do you do? In a mixed situation of that sort, resort to lethal weapons is very unsatisfactory. Um, possibly illegal, depending on <coughs> the exact circumstances. But doing nothing is unsatisfactory as well. And something like tear gas, or maybe an adaptation of the active denial system, where you would, in an indiscriminate fashion, affect the entire crowd, deter some, 
uh, scare others away, and aid in identifying who are the real threats, the ones who persist in remaining there and challenging your use of force, despite the fact that they've been shot with water cannon or tear gas or whatever, the faint of heart will be driven away. That enables you to, to concentrate on the bad guys. That is an indiscriminate use of force and therefore is highly suspect under the law of armed conflict. Um, there may be circumstances where the US military is nonetheless legally authorized to do that because it's not a law of armed conflict situation. It might be a peacekeeping mission. It might be a humanitarian aid mission. That not everything uh, that the US military does is guided by the strict law of armed conflict. But that seems to me to be a situation where the more advanced kinds of indiscriminate area denial systems might be highly advantageous. Yeah, and <laughs> but unethical. <laughs> yes. Well, let me just throw out a, a couple of real world scenarios. Um, you know, in the genesis for the non lethal weapons program in the Defense Department, it really started in Somalia. Uh, one real world example in Somalia was the case of a sniper, uh, you know, taking shots at our troops uh, out in the open because he had children sitting on his back as, you know, he lay prone with his gun, providing a moral dilemma, of course, for our troops, you know, take them out and, and kill the children or not. So in that instance, whether it's millimeter wave or some other non-lethal means, it maybe it does just make that person run away, but you have at least for the, the time being eliminated that threat. Um, similar, you know, in checkpoint situations um, in Iraq, and I think it was in 2003, um, U.S. troops fired on a, a vehicle approaching a checkpoint and uh, killed the individuals in the car, many were women and children, and they took their lethal action because, uh, you know, I think a couple of days prior, maybe a week prior, at a nearby checkpoint, a suicide bomber had attacked and killed four U.S. forces. So those are the situations, uh, examples of some of the situations that our military are in um, on a daily basis, and they have to make those, you know, split-second decisions on the, the use of force. Um, well, let me uh, just, let's continue can, this just... Can yeah, I make yeah, a comment absolutely. on those two sure. examples? Yes. I mean, I think, in fact, with both of the examples that you've given there, they're ones where, yes, a non-lethal weapon might be great, but it's actually going to be discriminate. Mm -hmm. yes. you know, if you target... Yes. Well, yes. If you target the gunman that's got kids yes. sitting on right. them with a non-lethal yes. weapon, yes. knowing that yes. if you accidentally hit the kids, you're not going to kill them, or well, that you weren't intending to hit the kids. Yes. Yeah, and um, that's... Well, yeah, and exactly. the car that's yes. coming to the checkpoint yes. and is not obeying directions, yes. if you target that, with a non-lethal weapon, you're targeting something that has become a legitimate military target. Well, then let me make it harder for you. Let, let me make it harder. <laughs> Suppose that it's not one gunman that you can identify who's surrounded with two civilians. Suppose there's a crowd, and they're far enough away that you can't quite see who it is who's got the gun. But you can tell that somebody's shooting at you, and you can tell that if you don't respond, they're going to keep shooting at you. And this capability lets you disperse the crowd. Is that unethical? Yes. Why? Well, uh, <laughs> I, should, I should moderate that. I mean, I, I love these scenarios because yeah. they are really real. messy and really yeah. complicated, right. and they bring into relief, I think, yeah. what's really important about this debate is that I think we, we have a decision to make. Mm -hmm. Regardless of whether it's with a non-lethal weapon to disperse the crowd or with lethal force, in both of those cases, if we're targeting a crowd, you are still targeting some people who are not legitimate objects of war. Now you might decide that because of utilitarian considerations, in other words, what the effects will be, the effects will be minor enough and the mission is important enough. But let's be real that that's a utilitarian argument there and what you're focusing on there is impact. But you are still targeting people who either under the laws of war or under just war theory and under ethical considerations, some of the people that you are targeting are not legitimate targets. They are not threats. Some of them are and some of them are not. And so that's why for me, this always, it keeps coming back, comes back to the issue of discrimination all the time. And the thing I worry about is are we using non-lethal weapons to, in a sense, say, well, it's really hard to tell who's who. I can't tell who's firing at me, so let's, let's target them with something that's less lethal or is going to have a less impact. What you're really doing there is avoiding the issue of discrimination. You're saying, I don't want to have to deal with that messy ethical stuff. We'll leave that to Professor Shanks Grin over in the philosophy department. 
I don't want to have to deal with that. So that's my worry, because if you do that there, then it just mm -hmm. seems like you're opening a Pandora's box of then under what circumstances can you, this is the lowering the threshold of force. Yeah. So you've got a serious riot you know, at the Libyan embassy, but then the next time you've got something a little less mm -hmm. serious and you're gonna do the same thing. I really worry about where that, where so, that goes. So Pauline, um, so would you agree then with, with Stephen's comment about this example I gave with the sniper, because you're targeting the sniper, yeah. even though there are children sitting on him, yeah. that that's okay? Yeah, if uh, yeah, you're and, using a yeah, non-lethal uh, weapon that we uh, can say is, yeah. is discriminant, in uh -huh. the case of the children being yeah. harmed, that's legitimate. Uh -huh. Collateral okay. damage. So you're just right. saying the yeah. other end where David's example was, you know, yeah. there may be some people who are in that crowd who aren't, you know, yelling and screaming or they're just, you know, yeah, you've got the taking plot pictures from, or something. You've got the plot from rules of engagement, yeah. uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. Where you have this kind of right. shooting and they can't yeah. tell who yeah. is shooting, right? Mm -hmm. And so you just, yeah. you know, you, you sort of target everyone, yeah. but you're still yeah. targeting everyone. My point. Well, then I'll stand up for that. I'll, I'll defend that on the grounds that um, the law of armed conflict is a human construct. It was not given to us on, ten, uh, on stone tablets. And if it does not serve modern human needs, then we can modify the principles. And especially if uh, we're in a circumstance where uh, to, to, to shift it on to terms that's more favorable for me, um, suppose it's not a law of armed conflict situation. Suppose it's not quite conflict. It's a peacekeeping mission or it's something else where the U.S. military is involved in protecting something and, uh, and we've merely got the ethical issue as opposed to the legal and ethical issue. Under that circumstance, I'd argue it is ethical to use the active denial system to target the civilians because the alternative is the bad guys are going to keep shooting at you. Well, and that raises, and maybe this is something people want to get into in discussion, this raises an interesting issue. My fourth and fifth points were this sort of what's the short-term effect mm -hmm. um, on especially non-combatants, but also combatants of using non-lethal weapons. But then what's the long-term effect? Because you're talking about a particular scenario, right? Mm -hmm. And so I could see, especially if I were a utilitarian, which I'm not, but if I were a good utilitarian, then if I'm just looking at the short-term utility of it, yeah, you're absolutely right. It seems like that in that case that the best scenario, the most ethical scenario, is to, is to you know, use this, this weapon. But then I would also argue we have to take a look at what are the long-term implications maybe for this conflict and also for conflict in general mm -hmm. if we start then saying, okay, in these kinds of situations, we can use this kind of weaponry. What's the long-term effect of that on conflict, on the restoration of the peace, on it, it, especially if like a peacekeeping mission, that kind of thing. Okay, uh, so uh, all right, with, with, uh, it's actually, I want to try to open it up to the audience a little bit. So yeah, okay. um, and I saw one hand. Um, did anybody have a question? Um, we had the microphone. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. Yeah, I think Steve should take <laughs> so I want to push on the discrimination point um, just slightly and just ask if, if maybe we're, we're, we're not overgeneralizing on that point. I mean, in the sense that you've got the crowd, and so from the aggressor who's intentionally using the crowd for the purposes of concealing or hiding amongst to commit hostile activities, um, you really, if you're on the receiving end of that, really only have two options, right? You either use some non-deadly some non force, some variety, or deadly force, or you simply impose a legal obligation to retreat or withdraw, which is nowhere in the law. So I guess my question is, is it really right to say that that's a violation of the principle of discrimination? I don't think it is. The right answer would be to say, here's a gradation of non-lethal technologies, and in that situation, we prefer sort of the graduated, escalated approach. But it, I can't see saying to a warfighter who's being shot on uh, fired at from within the mob, you can't lawfully or ethically do anything. That, ha that can't be the right answer. Well, I, I think it's more complicated because there's, there's, from the standpoint of the warfighter, which I'm completely sympathetic to, but I'm also sympathetic to the non-combatant in that crowd who has done nothing let's say for the sake of argument, hold on, let me finish. 
<laughs> and this is why you all need to go buy my book and read <laughs> chapter five, in which I argue we need more categories than just combatant and non-combatant because it's more complicated, right? Because I, I recognize that. But I do think that there is there's a problem with discrimination here, and I'm sympathetic to the warfighter, and I like non-lethal weapons to the degree that they give the warfighter more options, but we can't get, if we're using, the, say, the active denial system, I'm not, maybe you can convince me of how it is I'm not, you're not, the warfighter is still not targeting non-combatants. Well, That's my worry. So if you can convince me that somehow they're not being targeted, yeah. right? right? Not that it, the I don't, the effect for me is a different yeah. issue. Are are you still targeting them? Mm -hmm. um, if if you are, then it seems like that's still an issue for discrimination. Which is not to say it doesn't mean you can't do anything, but I do take discrimination really seriously. But you went back. You went back exactly where I was going to go, which is yeah. the flaw in the argument. Seems right. to me. Yes, you're not discriminating, but the point is you're not discriminating in that context with a non-lethal technology. I don't think you can separate the effects in that case from the principle of discrimination or distinction, which was originally intended and developed, as you know, solely based on the use of lethal force, intentionally directed, and you can't control the effects. Well, here the technology itself is controlling the effects, which is why it seems to me the appropriate way to do is to say, well, here's a context where you know, this form of non-lethal technology may be more appropriate than that form. Um, but you can't just simply say that the principle of dis discrimination is this non, or this, this homogenous monolithic, you can never direct force of any sort against any person non-combatant, because that's what non-lethal allows you to do in a way that you know intentionally you're not hurting them, you know, you're not creating any, depending on how, you, assuming you use it correctly. It just seems to me it's, it's much more nuanced to, than to say, the principle of discrimination, the, uh, discrimination doesn't uh, always precludes action in that. You can't say I, that. I guess I would argue that I think, um, and maybe we can pursue this further on the list, even in, <laughs> um, is, is that I think in, in that argument models two things that are conceptually different. So we may just have a basic. Yeah. And, and just so I can make a point of clarification, though, on the active denial systems that the Defense Department has, they are discriminant weapons. They okay. target individuals. Um, that's Within, how they're yeah. yeah, because they have to be lawful, and yeah. all mm -hmm. DOD non-lethal uh, weapons follow the same uh, rules yeah. of law. Yeah. So it is discriminant. I mean, my uh, version of ADS yeah. doesn't do <laughs> yeah. that. He, he envisions one that you yeah. could ban the, the beam and all, but that's not what we yeah. have in the military. I'll go with Dan's yeah. version. Two, yeah. two right. things there. Right. I mean, yeah. your situation with when you've got these, this person shooting at you from out of this crowd and you can't tell where they are. In fact, if you're hitting them with the DOD's active denial system, you're going to be using its target finding video, right. you know, camera. video camera, right. zoom in, find the right person, and then you're targeting them, not anybody else. Right. And if they still don't run away, you at least now have been able to pick out who it is. And you've probably got a bit of splash so that yes. the people who are just yes. next to them are now right. going, ooh, this feels really hot, and they move away. And now you actually are able to legitimately see and target this person yeah. with lethal force if they didn't move right. anyway. On your point, I think you slipped into something that's actually really, really common about non-lethal weapons. Because what you said, whether you realise or not, was you can use non-lethal weapons against these people who aren't combatants because you're not harming them. I think that's just garbage. I think you are harming them. If you've ever been pepper sprayed, it hurts. That is a harm. If you've ever been tasered, if you've ever watched someone being tasered, they scream, it hurts, that's a harm. And it's the same with the active denial system. It causes pain, that's why people move. If you get hit with tear gas, it's causing harm. And because they're non-combatants, because you've got a whole bunch of people mixed in there, you again get the situation where, well, you don't really know what the effect is going to be. Your intention might be to be using non-lethal force against this person who turns out to be asthmatic and you've just killed them with tear gas. Just, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's, uh, we have another over there. Okay, then we'll come down to Neil next, okay? Yeah. Okay, I want to come back to the, the illustration of the uh, defending the embassy and the crowd coming. Um, two observations. One, hard cases make bad law. They probably also make bad ethics. Two, if someone's in a crowd advancing on the embassy, they've put themselves in the role of combatant. So your, role, your argument of distinction no longer applies. If they're in the crowd advancing on an institution, they're a combatant. Could you use lethal force right. against them? 
I would not advocate lethal force because I think an AD. But on your but argument, justify. legally you could. That doesn't mean you should. Right. Okay. Same thing we do with set months. Because you can doesn't mean you should. Can does not imply ought. My my observation is, if you use something like the active denial system, you could push back the crowd and stop the advance on the embassy. And yes, there's some harm. But if you go to the long-term effects, it's probably minimal compared to using lethal force. Can we have a question over here? Thanks. Yeah. Two points, and probably uh, picks up on a few of the other comments that you made. First of all, um, a weapon is a weapon, um, and I mean. The RCRC's general view on this is that the outcome of the use of a weapon depends on various factors. The weapon, its characteristics, its mechanism of injury, the way it's used, and also then the vulnerabilities of the victim or victims that are affected by it. So um, it's best to look at weapons in terms of uh, the particular weapon and the particular way it's used. And I think in that sense, it's not useful to talk about weapons in terms of their lethality, or to try and sort of talk about uh, somehow there's another category of weapons. Um, I mean, from an IHL perspective, there are no different lethalities of weapons, they're just weapons. Um, and I don't know, you just can think of a simple example to illustrate this. You can use a firearm in a sort of non-fatal way by firing it in the air as a warning shot, or you can fire a plastic bullet at someone's head and easily kill them. So I think this is really important thing just to think of weapons as weapons. Um, on the point about um, targeting, I mean, core principle of, of the law of armed conflict, IHL, is, is you can't intentionally target civilians. That's simply, you know, probably the most, one of the most core rules of, um, uh, of IHL. And given what I say about weapons, uh, I think it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it doesn't make any sense to start suggesting that uh, because of some claims you attach to the capability of certain weapons that they, they should uh, undermine that, that core principle. Um, yeah. uh, there's a question, can, yeah. Can, can I make yeah, a comment sure. while we're moving to the next? Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to come back just thinking about your um, saying, will these people advancing on the embassy have become combatants because they're advancing on the embassy? Uh, and I draw a parallel with, again, the situation in Ferguson. Um, the people that are there protesting the actions of the police and saying hands up, don't shoot, and standing there in a crowd are not combatants. If somebody behind them starts throwing rocks at the police, then that person, you know, in... Police don't use these terms, but effectively you've got a combatant in amongst non-combatants. And these people are, don't become combatants just because they're there and somebody is throwing something from behind them. They're still non-combatants. Uh, I think again, talking to a bunch of, pe of um, police officers about the situation in Ferguson, a lot of the actions that the police took, they said, well, these people didn't follow our direction, so therefore they had broken the law and so on. But some of those directions did not appear to have been legal in the first place. So therefore, the people still, even if they did not follow those police directions, had not become combatants because they hadn't done anything illegal. So just because you've got a, a crowd advancing on an embassy doesn't mean these people have become combatants. If, for example, they were there protesting outside an American embassy somewhere, protesting the way that America was using force somewhere and killing non-combatants through the use of drones, which is a pretty plausible sort of thing in the current situation, I don't see how they become combatants just because they're advancing on the embassy as part of a protest. If they're using force, if they become trespassers, then the situation starts to change. But I still don't think that makes it just because they're trespassers doesn't make them combatants. But the, but the burden on you then is to say what you would do in that situation. I've had to accept in this conversation the burden of being a utilitarian. <laughs> <laughs> I've been called lots of nasty things, <laughs> and so I'll 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 accept that burden. But the burden in response is. What do you do when the crowd is advancing, whether it's in Ferguson or in Kabul? What, and, and you're in a law enforcement or a military operation. Of course, the standard legal, anal legal and ethical analysis is discrimination. You don't aim things at civilians. Fundamental. 
But what do you do? And what the active denial system, what my version of the active <laughs> denial system would enable you to do is to expose a new kind of technology that would further complicate the legal and ethical structures and enable you to do something that you haven't previously been able to do. And that is to impose your will on a circumstance without causing death, serious injury, and massive property damage. And that new technological fact, I think, does undermine the existing legal and ethical analysis. So what would you do? Sometimes I think the correct answer, in fact, though it's hard, is nothing. And be, allow the embassy to be overwhelmed. Nothing until you get to a certain point. So if you've got the point, <laughs> if you've got the point where you've got a fence and the people are overwhelming the fence, right. you know, then you can be saying, well, there are things, you know, these are the steps that are going to be taken. Loud hail is saying, if you come onto American property, you will be considered a combatant and you will be shot. This is a still a non-lethal response, but it's not using a weapon. You're just telling people this is what's going to happen. Are you bluffing, or would you really do it? I, um, in that circumstance, I think it's going to depend on a lot of factors. If it's one person that comes through just to see what you're going to do and you're able to take them into custody or something like that, then it's that's probably what you're going to do. Too easy. <laughs> it's, it's hundreds. They're climbing over the wall. They've ignored your, your bullhorns. And if you don't use some tech, something right now, you're overwhelmed. Bad cases make bad law. Well, but which is the bad law? Can I complicate this? Like, <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> um, I, I think one answer to what would you do, which I love that question, is that it may be that uh, from the standpoint of the warfighter in that situation, the, the, the right thing to do or the best thing to do is also the unethical thing to do. But we just need to acknowledge that we're crossing that line. Right, and not to say that because they're non-lethal weapons, that line doesn't really apply, or it's not so bad that we're violating discrimination, where discrimination really only applies when we're talking about lethal force. So it may be, and I'm sympathetic to especially this kind of case where the, let's say the embassy is going to be overrun by a crowd of people, and some of them seem very hostile, and other people just maybe are intoxicated or whatever it is, right? Um, and there may be times when we have to make really def tough decisions, and we, there may be times when, in fact, the thing that one chooses to do is, in fact, the unethical thing. I just want us to be honest that that's what we're doing. But why is right? it better that, to say That we're crossing that line, that there's a line here, and that we are, in fact, crossing that, and then we can talk about, and it seemed probably wouldn't agree with that necessarily, but... I, I do think, if we're going to, because I'm not a utilitarian, I want to be able to say, you might have to do, un you might choose to do unethical things, but then let's fess up. Well, why would we okay. want to okay, define let's, let's what you should do yeah. as being unethical? Why not change the vocabulary and say, in this circumstance, it is ethical to do what would, in other circumstances, not be ethical? Because I worry about what the long-term implications of that. Okay. All right, with that, we're going to take, there's a couple questions coming. Let's go right here first. Okay. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, I mean, well, the philosophical argument that, that I hear for non-lethal weapons goes go something like this. Uh, uh, it's like the, the, the threat, threats can only be, be eliminated but by force uh, because that's the only language that they understand. Uh, non-lethal weapons are, are, are better than, than lethal weapons. Uh, therefore, we we should use n non lethal weapons. Okay, but it, but it's like I I think that the that the premise that uh, that seems su suspect here is this mantra that that I hear being recited all the time, which is that uh, force is the only language that they understand. I mean, is it? I mean, if if you do. D define a, a, a weapon as that which can eliminate a threat. It isn't really the, the, the only real non-lethal weapon. Uh, love and kindness and, and understanding. And, and, and shouldn't this, this moral suasion be, be used to, uh, to eliminate threats? Yes. And in fact, I think that that's what should have happened in Ferguson and what did happen when they changed who was in charge and put the, 
um, highway patrol captain who has a local of Ferguson in charge and he said, we're not doing that force. We're doing something completely different. We're de-escalating. And the situation changed quite dramatically as soon as he started doing that. Now, again, it escalated later, I would argue, because of the actions of other people rather than the actions of that police officer and those he was responsible for. Okay. But yes, right, de-escalating and saying, no, we're not going to do anything is in fact a valid strategy. I want to just quickly jumping back to the embassy case. It may be, in fact, in some circumstances, you're going to say that the correct thing to do here is, in fact, to do nothing and even let the embassy be overrun and try and get the people out the back door. All right, with that, we're going to, we're going to take another question. Room or right. whatever. Let's but go ahead and take another question, uh, Colonel. Is. I'm so willing to go that far. I, uh, Colonel. Exciting as this conversation yeah. is, I'd like to go <laughs> somewhere completely different and ask okay. the panel for their thoughts on. Inform the use of information as a weapon of war. Um, and specifically, uh, as a non-lethal example, uh, I, I think of leaflets uh, that were used, for example, you know, for uh, tactical deception or psychological warfare. We've got aircraft that are essentially flying TV stations to push out messages. Uh, and of course, harkening back to the cyberspace panel, now we have you know, the cyberspace equivalent of leaflets, being able to push things directly to cell phones, for example, precision message delivery. Uh, I'd, I'd like to hear the panel's thoughts on uh, this as, is it a weapon or not, or, and how does uh, the precision delivery of messages and information fall into a category of weaponization or not? Um, that's a great question. I have the foggiest idea. Um, uh, but I think it's a really interesting question because that does get at discrimination, right? And we do have, you know, historical cases where you've targeted, say, civilian non-combatant populations with leaflets to try to get people to surrender or other propaganda or whatever. So I think that's a really interesting question. I'm not sure, I mean, I know what my intuition is, but um, I think that's really interesting because that's complicated in part because of the issue of we have to think about, about harm uh, and what the effect of that is. But is that still targeting? Is that still treating, let's say, non-combatants as an object of war? And if that is the case, is that legitimate? And here's the interesting thing. If that is legitimate, that would be really interesting because then that would really push us on if it's OK to target, let's say, the, the non-combatants of Dresden with uh, leaflets, you know, saying, Americans are your friends or whatever it is, right? If that's okay, if that's an acceptable form of targeting, then why is that okay but, say, targeting with non-lethal or lethal weapons is not okay? So I think it's a fabulous question. I have no idea. Um, let me just ask the panel something, and it kind of goes to Neil's well, point. Susan, just a second. Be before you go, <laughs> you have the answer to this question because yeah. the, the director. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of where I'm going. You know, it was terminology, and the Defense Department has defined what a non-lethal weapon is, and um, it's a you know uh, weapon, munition, or device that is explicitly designed you know to minimize civilian casualties or. Uh, uh, gross physical damage, and in the policy directive uh, for non-lethals, it excludes things like the leaflets and uh, information warfare and those other things, cyber war, electronic warfare. So right now, DOD has a very specific uh, definition for non-lethal weapons. But you know, Neil's point is, that, you know, don't call it non-lethal. A weapon is a weapon. And that's kind of where I'd like to get the panel's thought as well, because this terminology thing has been with uh, the program uh, since day one. Some people say, well, you shouldn't call it non-lethal, uh, because that makes people think it's going to be always non-lethal. And the DOD policy directive also makes it clear that's not the case. And some people say you should call it less lethal. Um, but I want to get the panel's thought. Does it really matter what you call it? Um, should we, you know, is non-lethal good? Should it be called something else, or should it be called nothing at all? Um, does it matter? What are your thoughts on, on this name that we've given these type of uh, capabilities we've been talking about? For me, the, the right name is significantly reduced probability of lethality. <laughs> <laughs> that does not trip lightly off the tongue. It doesn't have a good acronym <laughs> doesn't either. Like yeah. so, uh, but, but the reason I think that's the right name yeah. is that it doesn't convey the idea that there's a guarantee that it won't be legal because Nothing is reliably non-lethal. Air and water can kill you if administered in the wrong way. Uh, and so nothing is truly non-lethal. But it does seem to me, and this is a point where, that, that Neil and I have, to, have discussed, I think it does matter. I think there is a, uh, a qualitative difference 
among different types of weapons. And that it's useful sometimes to think of nuclear weapons in their own category. It's useful sometimes to think of chemical weapons in their own category. I think it's useful sometimes to think of a category of weapons that have a significantly reduced probability of lethality as having some usefully uh, unique characteristics that are worth thinking about. Not always, but sometimes they are, they are uh, distinct enough that they're worth thinking about as a, as a, as a, a separate category. Hey, um, Pauline, yeah, and, and I would argue that that's a really useful way of thinking about it because then it pushes us to these kinds of ethical questions that I'm mm -hmm. kind of polemically yeah. pushing us on, right? Mm -hmm. And sort of deliberately being a little Nietzsche in here, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, dropping some hand grenades here and there. Yeah. Um, but I think they do push us to think about discrimination and proportionality and collateral damage and, mm -hmm. and what does it mean to say mm -hmm. target certain people and not target other people. So, uh, and I, I do think it's a useful category. I do think people can get hung up on mm -hmm. non-lethal means no one's ever gonna get harmed. And the, the thing that worries me there is just sort of the public perception that, well, we could use uh, lethal and also non-lethal weapons and, w and if that lowers our threshold for going to war then I find that very worrisome right because yeah. it's going to be it's that zero casualty yeah. kind of you know okay. yeah I mean I do think that the term has entered into use and I don't think we generally get to choose whether it's going to get used or not but we can say as I always do when I start to talk about these things in any papers or presentations look this is what I'm talking about here and give it a specific use and say look there's nothing that's reliably normally but um, perhaps there are things that are reliably non-lethal maybe uh, you could say a permanently blinding laser weapon is reliably non-lethal at the time. But that's certainly not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about anything that's designed to do permanent damage. So when I'm talking about non-lethal weapons, then I'm specifically saying I'm talking about weapons whose, in, uh, whose effects are tended, intended to be non-lethal, um, to leave no lasting harm, to wear off after a certain period of time, and so on. So there are plenty of other things that you could fit in and say, well, this weapon isn't designed to kill people. Um, certain types of landmines probably fit into that category. They're designed to blow your legs off, but they're not designed to kill you. But we certainly, again, don't want to be talking about those as non-lethal weapons. And I think we have, in fact, it's entered into terminology that we've captured these sorts of things by this term. We need to be more specific about how we use it. We need to be careful and say, well, hey, look, pepper spray can kill people. It does happen. Tear gas can kill people, so can tasers, so can, I'm sure, the active denial system used in the wrong way. But this is what we're talking about. We need to be aware of these concerns about how they're used, but I do think that the term has still got some benefit. Okay, well, thank you. Okay, so we're at the, like, the five-minute mark here. So with that, um, I'm going to ask the panelists to kind of give any of their last thoughts that they would like to leave uh, the audience with. So, um, actually, we're going to start with you, Stephen, uh, because uh, you had got to go last in the opening, <laughs> yeah. so you get to go first. Oh, now I get to go first. Yeah. Um, I think my main concern, particularly with military use of non-lethal weapons, is that there's a psychological barrier there that I'm concerned about crossing. Um, if you've got, for example, one of the situations that often got discussed about this was when US had so many troops in Iraq and they're saying, well, if you've got some scared soldier at a checkpoint in Iraq, wouldn't it be better if they had a non-lethal weapon to use against this person walking towards them instead of a lethal one? I think there is actually a real psychological barrier there. They're going to be thinking really, really, really hard before they pull the trigger if they know they're going to kill this person. If they're thinking, well, this is a non-lethal weapon, I don't think you're going to see, like I showed with the Queensland police, I don't think you're going to see that used oh, these six times we would have shot someone, these six times we used a non-lethal weapon instead. I think, well, we might have shot six people before, now we're going to use non-lethal weapons against 2,000 people. I think you're going to see that dramatic escalation, and I think, in fact, you're going to end up causing more harm that way. Um, yeah, I would just agree with what uh, Stephen said, and um, I, I think that... Um, that war and conflict is messy, it's ethically messy, and I don't think technology can solve that. Um, so to the degree that some people view non-lethal weapons as sort of a way to circumvent uh, different kinds of things or not have to worry about discrimination or change proportionality, that makes me twitchy. 
Mm -hmm. um, it's messy. It should be messy, mm -hmm. and and that's why moral judgment is so important. So. Okay. David? Um, and I'll just close by saying that I think uh, even on this panel, we are in danger of underappreciating the effect of technology upon our social interactions, our legal and ethical and human connections with each other. It seems to me that the, uh, the entire day today has been a study of how new technology has uh, the possibility of revolutionizing the way people interact with each other. And there's an old saying that the only thing harder than getting a new idea into your head is getting an old idea out of your head. And it's quite possible to me that our 18th, 19th, and 20th century legal and ethical structures need modification to deal with modern technology and non-lethal weapons uh, uh, might be just one illustration of that. OK, well, please join me in thanking the panel. Okay, and I don't know, um, I guess somebody from Seatmons is going to wrap it up. No, just to thank on behalf of, of Setmons, um, uh, all of you for coming and for the panelists who uh, did great, uh, a great job, all of you. And uh, thank you very much and look forward to the publication of papers from this. And um, do the panelists know what their next moves are? Um, okay, we'll talk to you about them. <laughs> thank you very much and thank you uh, uh, for filling in at the last minute, yeah, Susan. Oh, no that problem. Was really okay. Yeah. Well, that was great. I look forward to reading the materials. <laughs>